Hello, I'm Richard Hara, and this is Social Impact Live, a weekly conversation with members of the Columbia School of Social Work community. Um, as you know, we've been experiencing some technical difficulties today, so we're not running live, but we're hoping to integrate questions from the audience later on in the program, as we usually do. So let's move on to our guest, uh, Dr. Mishura Akilova, who's a full-time lecturer at the Columbia School of Social Work. Mishura, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, yes, we've been um, anticipating having you on the program here for quite a while and to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on refugees. And But before we do, I thought maybe just to hear a little bit about your personal journey uh, to uh, study uh, refugees and, and to incorporate them into our uh, understanding of an international perspective in social work. So if you could just give me a little bit of background, if you could. Sure, yes. Um, first, let me start by welcoming our viewers today. Thank you for tuning in twice, um, last week and this week, and how symbolic uh, is uh, that we were not able to get access to live uh, of the challenges that this population faces uh, worldwide. So a little bit about me. I come originally from um, uh, how they are defined one of the uh, less economically developed countries um, that have uh, that has also suffered um, uh, as a, a result of uh, conflict uh, and post-conflict development um, and uh, where uh, we uh, did not have the social work profession in existence. So uh, in my practice as an educator in public schools and later on as a journalist, uh, I have started seeing more and more social problems um, that prevented children from actually focusing on classes so I started searching for ways I could be more useful and um, that led me to a uh, social work profession. Um, I got my master's from here, um, from uh, uh, one of the uh, universities uh, here in the US. I went back and I started working with children uh, and their families who were uh, who dropped out of school, who were working, or uh, whose families were suffering um, because of mass unemployment, poverty, uh, moving to uh, other countries in search of jobs um, to survive. Uh, so that um, was more of a practice post my MSW. But then I uh, actually started facing many roadblocks, um, given that the systems were not developed, the social work profession was was not developed, social welfare was not developed, and um, and um, working with multiple stakeholders from the governments to NGOs, international uh, organizations who were supporting, uh, you know, the population during that time, I found that um, I needed um, to do more, um, and, and that led me to macro social work and my journey to Columbia University, where I got my PhD. Um, so I focused on um, building, you know, the existing, the uh, building the new data that would um, then lead to more evidence-based programming and policy making, and as well, you know, the uh, one another, uh, you know, purpose um, for me getting my PhD and staying in this teaching role was um, based on my observations of how international development field worked uh, in the in those countries where uh, mostly, you know, international stakeholders would come and practice and not necessarily um, the most, uh, the practices were not necessarily the most effective. Um, so um, I, I decided that my purpose would be um, training and preparing um, the practitioners who are going into the field who will be ready to the challenges of the field and who uh, would um, actually be uh, creating, designing, implementing programs that would uh, make an impact rather than hurt um, the population. So I do that also by 
supporting the um, you know post-Soviet countries in building their social work uh, profession and developing further developing um, the social welfare systems here at Columbia School of Social Work. Um, then I teach more of a international and policy internationally focused on policy classes and also try to bring that international focus um, to our school to strengthen our curricula and um, this is of course then uh, one like, that, that's how uh, I got engaged in uh, creating this experiential course uh, focusing on social work practices with refugees yeah so so yeah so it's it's tremendous that you you're able to bring your experience and expertise to our school to give us a more international perspective on practice and 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 how uh, social work education can incorporate a more global perspective so could you tell me a little bit more about this course on refugees that you've developed um, here at the School of Social Work? Uh, what's the focus and, 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 and what are the aims? Yeah, absolutely. No, uh, we have a great uh, program and of course, um, uh, excellent resources at Columbia, especially nowadays that um, the university is also moving uh, beyond just research and uh, teaching to uh, have uh, to, to use the resources we have here at Columbia to support um, um, uh, the organization's people working in the field. Um, so as, as part of that, as well as by noticing the desire of our students to um, practice in humanitarian field and international uh, social work field, uh, I thought that uh, experiential courses would give them this opportunity to be prepared uh, before they have to take the responsibility. Uh, we had this, you know, great platform uh, where Dr. Marti has developed the, her travel classes on social work with, uh, 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 in, in Chile and in Cuba. So based on that platform, I thought that I would make it more focused on the specific population of the uh, uh, displaced population that includes, of course, the refugees, um, the internally displaced persons, the um, uh, stateless persons um, who um, are, the, 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 this population, the number of this population has been increasing day by day because of uh, everything that is happening globally, of course, the conflict uh, and now we are adding the environmental refugees um, to the list that uh, list will be growing. Now we have uh, close to 70 one million people um, of concerns, um, which includes all these groups. But um, as we know, these groups uh, are located in less um, um, resource-rich countries, uh, usually uh, in neighboring countries where um, the conflicts are happening. So um, the more uh, resource-rich countries like US, EU, of course, are doing uh, you know, a great job by resettling the refugees, but we know that it's at uh, that number is tiny. Uh, mm -hmm. It's like a drop in the ocean because you know only one percent of the refugees are resettled, while while ninety nine percent of the displaced people are located in other regions like Turkey, host four million, um, Jordan, like close so, to one and a half million. Yeah, so I, I'm I'm curious. Um, if that's the definition of a of a refugee and, and how we come up with these numbers and and you were saying 70 71 million right all together when we talk about refugees mm -hmm. uh, displaced persons and uh, stateless people um, so what technically is the definition of a refugee is it someone who flees a country for example um, because of um, something like uh, COVID-19 would they qualify as a refugee so usually they, um, the refugees are the ones who do not have the protection of their own country, right? Or they are fleeing because of the conditions that um, uh, put their lives at risk mm -hmm. and that include, you know, of course, the refugees who cannot stay in their countries because of war or because of persecution um, that uh, potentially is uh, risky to their lives. Then we have the asylum seekers who are also, you know, it's the same group of refugees, but the only difference is that they are already located in the countries outside uh, of their countries and are looking for protection while being uh, outside of their countries. 
countries, mm -hmm. uh, while refugees have to apply within their own countries in order to be resettled. And then we have the internally displaced persons who are, uh, uh, of course, persons uh, in exactly the same situations, but they are displaced, um, you know, within the borders of their country. So it's a totally different process uh, while we are addressing the needs of the IDPs. Stateless people like the Rohingyas, for instance, the largest group, uh, are currently, you know, the group that don't have any protection of any government. Um, so now that they are located in um, Bangladesh, for instance, the uh, largest groups are uh, are located there. Um, they they may be considered refugees, but still they don't have any kind of documentation um, that uh, will prove that they have some kind of protection from um, their own country. So with COVID-19, uh, I'm not really sure whether, you know, this will qualify. Potentially, I think there are many, you know, uh, uh, the, the definitions and the conditions of the official refugee uh, definition based on the conventions that have been accepted just right right after the world war uh, are very different um, based on those uh, you know conditions there is a ge geographic limitations uh, which only uh, is uh, available uh, to protect the people who were affected because of um, the world war, right? So this is mostly the European uh, countries, people who are fleeing from those countries. Later on, you know, they have uh, added other uh, protection conditions, but it definitely does not include environmental refugees. Um, it definitely does not include economic, uh, you know, re refugees. And they are all, you know, even though uh, potentially their lives are at risk if they stay, they are not under this, um, this protection. Well, it, it underscores that when we use the label refugee, that it covers a whole range of different people in different circumstances. And I know that there are refugees who are resettled here um, in the New York area. Um, there are refugees um, in South America, in um, South Asia, in Africa, uh, and everywhere. So, um, so when we think about, you know, refugees, uh, often we think about them, you know, sort of being in 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 these uh, camps, right? Um, and where I think the conditions um, are certainly. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, not good uh, in the midst of this global pandemic. So, um, so based on your experience, I mean, how, how are these refugees, um, you know, going to manage and, and, and cope in the face of, of what's going on now? Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a, a question that has been concerning this community that is working with them and knows the challenges uh, uh, of, um, you know, uh, the conditions they live in. Um, just to, uh, you know, let you know that many of the refugees are, of course, uh, you know, are not only living in camps. So that's, you know, another uh, framework right. we have in our minds when we think about refugees, like in Turkey, for instance, 90% um, live in urban areas, um, uh, it, which is like uh, uh, very close to, um, you know, the numbers in other countries as well. But those who are living, but even though they are living in urban areas, they still um, do not have um, the conditions to be able to have the privilege of um, uh, remain in um, protected place. So usually they will live in, you know, over, um, out, how would you say, overcrowded uh, apartments, uh, substandard housing, um, and and those who are located in camps, they are ev in even more uh, risky conditions, given that a majority live in tent, um, you know, tent-like uh, settings, or not at all, you know, in open spaces. Uh, many groups are living in open spaces. Um, so an example, for instance, even if it is, you know, in camp-based settings, in Greece currently, they have have this transit camp uh, where they keep um, those crossing the border trying to uh, go to uh, re trying to be resettled in European Union um, in Camp Moria for instance they have only 3,000 like it, it was uh, built um, for 3,000 refugees and now mm -hmm. it is holding 
20,000 refugees. And imagine what happens if they are in lockdown, right? Uh, it, uh, it, and um, it, the conditions themselves are the, the 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 concern, meaning that there is no water hygiene. Uh, you know, the spacing of the camps um, is uh, is not conducive to being safe and protected. But mm -hmm. at the same time, we have this uh, uh, camps uh, where they are already uh, dependent on the support that is provided from the outside. When you're locking them down, when you're trying to protect uh, your own workers uh, in humanitarian, you know, smaller agencies that are working, we have been getting the stories how all these organizations are closing down and it's only, you know, the medical help that they are getting or just, you know, the food um, they, um, they, they get from the outside. It puts them in even more, you know, dangerous conditions. Yeah, I'm wondering, um, certainly uh, overcrowding, hygiene, and, and so on are, are certainly uh, concerns, but I, I can't help but wonder, you know, here in the United States, we're, we're concerned, we're worried about the number of ventilators that we have in New York City and New York State, right? And, and, and uh, what does healthcare even look like um, in, in a place where, where you find refugees? No, absolutely. You, you're right. Uh, it's, uh, if, if we are so overwhelmed, uh, given that we have, of course, one of the, you know, best healthcare in the world, uh, healthcare systems in the world, you know, we, we can talk about all the problems, but still we have all the resources. We have the protection of the state government, the federal government, um, and here it's like everyone is first dependent on the money that being sent um, by all those, you know, resource rich countries um, that are usually the donors. Um, and now that they are, you know, just, you know, overwhelmed with their own responses, that is already uh, being put as a secondary, if not, you know, um, the, the last concern of the countries. But at the same time, we know that uh, you know, the access to healthcare is already uh, very, very reduced, right? Uh, and many uh, refugees not even, not, not even having any access at all. Um, in, uh, in the camps, it's like makeshift, you know, uh, hospitals, clinics that are dependent on few doctors and uh, visit like the medical personnel um, that come uh, to provide the care in urban settings, uh, dependent on the host country conditions, right? In Turkey, for instance, um, the Syrians who are registered can only get access to uh, medical care in the region where they have registered. But we know mm. that this group is very mobile. So if they move from one region to another one, um, then they cannot get that primary care um, mm. and they have to pay out of pocket. And we know that they don't have those resources. Yeah. Uh, in emergency settings, we were just talking with um, some uh, doctors uh, uh, who are you know, supporting the refugees and other uh, groups of population in Turkey. They were talking about how the doctors are, uh, it, it might be coming if they they face, for instance, conditions like um, the, the ones in Italy or here in New York, and they have to make decision about who to keep, uh, you know, alive or not. If there are no um, equipment, then um, that is a huge ethical concern. And, um, you know, I've been looking at some numbers in Bangladesh where there are one million, you know, Rohingyas um, living in uh, basically, you know, uh, open space, right? Like there are many, many concerns already about the space. They have uh, 45 um, beds, ICU beds uh, for one million. Wow. If you generally look at the healthcare access and the access to doctors, uh, you know, most of uh, the majority of the 71 million million are located in less developed countries, mm -hmm. right? In Uganda, for instance, there is one doctor for 10,000 people, persons. So it's for the overall population. We are not even talking about the refugees. So these are already, you know, under-resourced countries struggling with their own problems. So mm -hmm. uh, it is going to make it even worse that, that they, therefore everyone is scared that if COVID-19 reaches the refugees, uh, they are going to um, bear the most um, burden. Mm, I, I, so I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how these people um, in these dire circumstances uh, are coping, right? And, and how, how, how can we um, 
here in the United States or elsewhere um, best support them? I mean, for example, um, and I've got some questions from the audience here. Uh, have people been establishing mutual aid networks to help people uh, or help each other, I guess, in refugee camps during um, this pandemic? Kind of yeah. similar to what has been happening here as well, right? Uh, mutual aid and support, right. is, that, is that happening? Yes, and I mean the uh, the the good. Um, um, there is a lot to learn um, from refugees because mm. they have been dealing with this uncertainty, anxiety. You know, under uh, resource, uh, being under resource and being creative. Uh, I think they are more, uh, um, uh, they, there is more empathy, uh, not only toward each other but also um, the general population. There are, you know, lots of stories uh, of, of refugees uh, who have their own businesses supporting each other. Right, still, you know, working even within within the camps. Um, there are many, you know, smaller uh, businesses and that in the food sector that are mm -hmm. helping each other, or those who are also, you know, working are resettled in other countries, mm -hmm. trying to support the um, uh, older and older population and uh, those who have some mobility issues. Uh, I, I think it's it uh, somewhat, I, I guess, ironic. I, I read somewhere that uh, in Germany. Um, refugees who the there were people there who uh, were very resistant to them coming are now um, the very people who are staffing hospitals and and providing you know that that frontline uh, assistance to people medical assistance um, so so yeah so certainly um, refugees are contributing um, what they can contribute and and I think it speaks to what we've learned in social work practice that it's not us as social workers to be providing all the answers necessarily, but yeah. I mean, the people who are closest to problems often uh, are closest to the solutions. So, exactly. so what, yeah, what can we draw from the experience uh, otherwise from, from refugees that, that you think, um, you know, would, would help to build that, that support? Yeah, no, um, you know, when we visited um, the camps in Jordan um, uh, last year, mm. uh, we were surprised to learn how much there is resilience uh, and how much, uh, you know, we can learn from them because, you know, they, um, they, have, uh, they have been, uh, you know, against of our ideas of how the refugees in this, you know, situation would look like. They were, you know, uh, happy, they were supportive, they built the community um, that supported each other, but also the organizations working with them uh, on the ground in this, you know, host countries. I think and, and we need to really acknowledge all the great work that they are doing, organizing themselves, supporting with food, the services, advocating for them. Uh, I think they have been doing uh, such a great job uh, given how much they have been overwhelmed and also dealing with their own problems in those societies. Uh, so definitely, I think we can learn uh, to be better practitioners, like uh, some of the students were talking about uh, in the past in their reflections of how they learned about the cultural humility from mm -hmm. these organizations who are not social workers, but rather, you know, by just being with them and, uh, you know, being in tune with their needs and providing as much as, you know, as they can, providing as much support as they can, they are already being much better social workers than uh, just, you know, that the, the than just um, the training that might they might have gotten from the books, right, or just mm -hmm. from uh, from the theory um, in school. So uh, I think we can learn that. But also thinking about our own roles, uh, being the citizens of uh, you know, or uh, you know, living in the countries uh, where we have. Uh, a lot of resources. We have the democracy. We have. Uh, we can, you know, make make sure our voices are heard. Uh, it is important for us to uh, activate as well. Of course, the first thing is like, of course, if if you have the ability and privilege to uh, uh, support with uh, funding, right? Any organizations like Doctors Without Borders, like IRC, UNICEF, uh, UNHCR, and smaller organizations who are fighting to um, actually. Uh, 
improve their conditions, improve our uh, response to the needs of this displaced population. Um, they are already doing um, great, a great job. So um, that's one way to support them. Uh, on the, you know, uh, macro level, country level, um, there are great, you know, um, practices like Portugal, for instance, uh, dealing with, you know, the issues of, um, uh, COVID-19 themselves, like the the the, the, uh, the overall population, they just gave asylum to everyone automatically to everyone who has applied um, uh, in in the past, and they have their you know open application. So uh, we can definitely you know do that here in the U.S. as well or uh, maybe even, you know, increase the number of those who are resettled. Like in the US, we have a cap at 18. We only have resettled close to six and a half or maybe less than that, thousand refugees. And imagine Turkey is dealing with 4 million uh, refugees. In Lebanon, it's like one fourth of their population. And unfortunately, I, you know, when you've got a global pandemic going on, it's just all too easy for people to say, well, we need to close the borders, right? And, and, and uh, it just breeds uh, um, xenophobia. I, and and it, I, I wonder if I could just maybe broaden um, our scope here to, to talk a little bit more about immigrants in, in general. I, I know that you've studied um, migrant labor um, in Central Asia and, and certainly I mean, how how is how are immigrants um, affected by something like this COVID nineteen situation, as you see it? Yeah, no, it's uh, you know the the same. Uh, it, they generally they are more affected that uh, than the uh, you know the local population in any country uh, because you know they tend to um, do the jobs that might be considered essential, right? So mm. uh, in the food sector, in the service sector, um, uh, if we take just the uh, medical, uh, right, then the medicine and healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, we know in US, one fourth of the physicians are immigrants. 40% of home health aides are immigrants. Uh, you know, up to 50% of the food sector, um, the, the workers are immigrants. So uh, definitely they would be the ones who would be impacted the most. And, uh, you know, I think uh, we need to think about how we can offer that protection because nowadays was the stimulus package even in the US uh, of course everyone who has filed taxes uh, is able to get uh, the the protection at least you know whatever the financial protection mm -hmm. it may be or with having the health care uh, health insurance they will have an easy access to uh, hospitals and care while you know if we think about 11 million undocumented here. How are they protected? Um, they are still, they don't have the luxury of staying home. They have to work because they don't have any access to um, uh, welfare, right? And the livelihoods are impacted. Same with refugees. Many work in informal sector. Many are not recognized because of earlier, you know, right. definition that I mentioned. They depend on, you know, going to work every day. And, and therefore, they, they, they will, you know, carry that burden um, in the past, like with the, um, like in the past crisis, like Ebola or SARS or MERS, uh, we know that, you know, the, con the, the number of deaths um, uh, that came as a result of um, carrying the, or experiencing the, the disease was equal to other conditions uh, uh, because other conditions, uh, like um, I'm just you know remembering um, the recent publications by by our public health uh, school, school of public health um, that mentioned that, for instance, with Ebola in West Africa, there were close to 12. 12,000 people died of Ebola, but then there were 11,000 deaths uh, because of other conditions that could have been preventable if this, you know, refugees, displaced people had access to healthcare, mm -hmm. um, such as, you know, the, um, I'm forgetting my words, but um, like the uh, heart conditions, the mm -hmm. respiratory conditions, the uh, child and, uh, you know, uh, maternal mortali mortality deaths, uh, just because they were not able to get the healthcare. So uh, definitely we have to consider when we are thinking, you know, uh, 
I think it's, it's, it's harder to think about it this right now, given how divided our society uh, mm -hmm. is, not only in the US, but globally as well. But in future, yeah. hopefully that will put us in a better place to be more inclusive. Well, I've got a comment here from um, someone in the audience. Um, well, it's asking, did it help to have the UN Secretary General urge warring parties across the world to lay down their weapons in support of the bigger battle against COVID-19? So I don't know if there's an opportunity here. Um, you know, the Secretary General called COVID-19 the common enemy that is now threatening all of humankind. Um, right. So, I mean, there is that hope, um, but uh, at the same time, you know, I think yeah. that there's also a, a retreat. Um, yeah. You know, of, of I, I think, I think, you know, uh, at least, you know, in Syria, we know that there have been bombings of the northern Syria and there have been, you know, more than one million uh, displaced persons just in the mm -hmm. past months. Uh, and that has stopped, which means that the bombing of the hospitals has stopped because mm -hmm. that uh, somehow, you know, they targeted the hospital, which left, you know, the northern Syria uh, almost was, you know, zero access to healthcare. Um, so uh, that probably, you know, was helpful, but we don't know how long-term this will be. But at mm -hmm. the same time, we don't really have that leadership um, that we used to have uh, in the U.S. And as, you know, other countries are dealing with this, uh, because, you know, as has been proven with Ebola crisis, you know, that kind of leadership, the global leadership that brought everyone together uh, in the face of this kind of pandemic crisis was helpful in uh, going against that uh, common enemy, even if they were not affected. Now mm -hmm. that everyone is affected, I am not really sure. And everyone is trying to, you know, get the resources for themselves. I, I don't think that these are the practices that mm -hmm. uh, will be helpful to really fight that global enemy. You know, uh, mm -hmm. we recently had this, you know, announcement that um, the funding to WHO may be reduced um, uh, from our government. So that is also concerning. But I, and then, you know, there are sanctions um, that other countries are facing, which may also limit this exchange of resources, knowledge, and all the humanitarian aid that needs to uh, uh, be uh, sent to those countries who are mm -hmm. struggling. Um, yeah, I, I think the UNHCR had put out a plea for um, uh, roughly $2 billion um, being needed to uh, just address some basic needs um, with refugees currently. So, and, and you know, there's somebody, uh, I have a uh, question from the audience. Some countries are not accepting refugees, but sending quote unquote containers to give refugees in camps more space. Um, I, I don't know um, how, whether this is a really um, an effective form of, of, right. of assistance. We really do need to, to think um, at a much larger scale um, when you're talking about 71 million people who are vulnerable and at risk. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And, and those containers are not going to do anything because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you are in a camp setting, you still have to line up for food, right? You still have to line up uh, to go to the bathroom. Um, those containers would not have all those conditions. Um, the, of course, the better, you know, uh, uh, like the best uh, scenario would be if, you know, countries came together and took everyone, you know, uh, somehow distributed and gave them um, the normal conditions to live to normalize mm -hmm. their lives. Now that we are stuck in our homes, we will kind of more emphasize with, you know, not having control or not having, you know, ability to do, to lead our lives in normal ways. But imagine how it is for people to live years. Um, the average number for resettlements, like uh, from three to 11 years, can you imagine being living in those conditions for those, uh, mm -hmm. for ha those many years? So it's not really going to solve much unless, you know, we really give them um, the, the conditions um, like, um, you know, having the homes, having mm -hmm. ability to work, having ability to get education because nobody wants to uh, depend on the give outs, right? Everyone right. wants to work and um, uh, provide for themselves and their families. 
Well, you know, because it is such a political issue, I, I don't know that we're going to be able to solve it anytime soon. It's going to be an ongoing, and I guess conversation would be a polite way of putting it. Um, but uh, I think that your course on refugees at, at the School of Social Work is uh, at least a contribution that social workers can both work here and also uh, internationally to contribute um, to their, um, you know, better lives. So, um, so I want to thank you for joining us here on Social Impact Live today. Despite all the barriers and obstacles, we finally had you on the program and, and I'm very grateful for that. It was an absolute uh, pleasure to be here and um, uh, communicate with our viewers, uh, even though it's, it has been not direct communication. So I'm happy to also answer questions uh, on the uh, uh, Facebook page um, uh, if they post questions. But also just want to you know remind that it was also a privilege for us to be able uh, to join uh, remotely and uh, from the uh, shelter of uh, our you know homes um, that are safe and protected. So uh, thank you all for being here and caring enough, uh, you know, to, to learn about um, the plight of the displaced population. Hopefully, you know, uh, if you're joining in as social workers or other practitioners, uh, you are already in this, uh, in this fight to make their lives better. So thank you, everyone. And happy holidays to all of you who are celebrating. Yes, on that note, thanks very much to everyone who tuned in today uh, to this special edition of Social Impact Live with Dr. Mashura Akilova. Um, our next program is scheduled for next Tuesday, and we'll have Tim Hunt, um, who's going to speak about the collision of two epidemics, certainly COVID-19, but also the ongoing uh, opioid epidemic. So until then, thank you very much. Take care. Stay safe and see you then. Bye-bye.